You are listening to the Anxiety Podcast, where we support you to overcome anxiety and reduce stress. We will get vulnerable and it will be real. Here's your host, Tim J.P. Collins. Hello and welcome to the Anxiety Podcast, episode 172. This week I am talking to somebody who wrote a book called Fifty Shades of Kale. He loves his food and what it can do for us from a mental health point of view. And we're going to get into all that today. We're going to talk about great food and why it's so important for our health. So let's get on to that in a moment. Before I give you the full introduction to him, I would like to remind you the Less Anxiety, More Life Retreat is coming up the 16th to 19th of February. Me and um, about 10 people, that's about the size of the group where we're going to have, are going to San Diego in California, are going to be working through a variety of things to overcome our anxiety, some group work, some exercise, some relaxation, some things perhaps we haven't done before, a variety of things that I've curated and put together from my own experience, things that I wish I'd done in the early days of starting to try and overcome my anxiety. So that's why I've put it together because I just believe that retreats can be so impactful to um, our journey and, and how we can expand and consider what's possible in the future of our lives. Um, so check out that. You can go to the website anxietypodcast.com. There's a link for retreats. Go there. All the information is there. And uh, if you are interested, we will get on the phone and I will give you the full lowdown. Okay. Also, while you're on the website, the Anxiety Journal, um, people are really giving us some great feedback about the fact that they're enjoying the daily journaling process. It's a way that you can really be held accountable to yourself to move in the right direction in terms of really doing the work to overcome anxiety. So check that out at the same time. And lastly, if you're not yet a member of the Less Anxiety, More Life community, you can click a button on the front of the website, join the group, um, it's growing by the day, um, and not only by the amount of people, but also the knowledge and expertise and love in that group and the care for each other is, uh, is really outstanding. So I encourage you to get in there and be part of that. Okay. Let's get on to today's guest, Dr. Drew Ramsey, psychiatrist, a thought leader, an author, a food advocate, a farmer, and a kale hero. Um, he probably has T-shirts with kale on them. He's also done TED Talks um, on the subject as well. So he's a board-certified psychiatrist and, as I said, best-selling author of Fifty Shades of Kale. Um, he's also written a book called The Happiness Diet, and his newest book is called Eat Complete, which was released in 2016. And he's basically spent years researching the important role of food, um, not just for health, but for its overall influence on mental health. And I'll let Drew give you his kind of own introduction, but we kind of get into why it's such an important component of, you know, the treatment essentially for anxiety and some easy things and some memorable things that you can start including in your diet today. So without further ado, let me introduce you to Drew. Here we go. Okay, so Dr. Drew Ramsey, welcome to the Anxiety Podcast. Thank you so much, Tim. It's great to be with you this morning. Excited to talk about anxiety. Yeah, and you're coming coming in from uh, New York City, is that right? That's right. I'm, 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 I'm uh, calling in from my psychiatry office right here in New York. I've just... Uh, just seen a few patients and uh, getting getting settled in, so it's a nice yep. nice little break to speak with you. Yep, hopefully you're nice and warm. It's it's warmer than expected, but uh, <laughs> it's uh, you know it's a little a little drizzly and rainy here in New York. Yeah, I have to say I was uh, I was stalking you on Instagram yesterday. I'm not sure if it's called stalking on Instagram because I suppose you're supposed to look on Instagram. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I. I I wanted to find out a bit more because I know you're sort of from a farming background to some extent, and I saw a video of your mum chopping wood, which was very impressive. Massive axe or maul or whatever you call it. Could you tell us a bit about that? Yeah, sure. So uh, we split our time. I'm from southern Indiana, which is a really rural part of America, um, and grew up there and then kind of made my way to New York City, where I've been for about the last uh, 16, 17 years. Um but my mom and dad still still uh, do, you know, they're tough farm folk. And so the video you saw, we were uh, splitting, getting our wood, our uh, uh, wood pile uh, uh, chopped. Yeah. And so that's always a kind of really, it's actually one of my favorite ways to deal with anxiety is chopping wood. It's just a very, um, it's a great, it's a great exercise and uh, 
requires yeah. a lot of focus. But yes, yeah, so my mom came out and we're you know joking around and she used to split a lot of firewood herself. She's now 75 and a half mm. has back problems. Uh, you know, and she looked at me in the eye, picked up that splitting mall and, uh, yeah, the Instagram is Drew Ramsey MD. That's, um, if anybody else wants to take yeah, a peek, but she, you check out the, the speed of the splitting mall in the first couple of wax. Um, it's, <laughs> it's impressive. So it's, uh, it's like a 14 pound mall. So yeah, yeah that's my mom. <laughs> yeah. She's good. I used to, I, I used to love splitting wood in one of my previous houses. And they always say when you chop firewood, it warms you or firewood warms you twice. Once when you chop it and once when you burn it. But yeah, that's um, true. That's true. Anybody who split wood can attest to that. Yeah. I researched and found this, I think it's Swedish or Finnish ax called a Fisker. Um, and so it ended up not being quite as heavy and still being, uh, deadly accurate. So maybe you need to get one of those for your mom. Maybe a fist could be better. I'm, I'm using the, uh, uh, monster mall, which was actually Ronald Reagan's mall of choice. Wow. Uh, so <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, that's the, uh, yeah, that's the serious one. Um, but anyway, uh, let's move on to mental health, even though, as you said, if you have access to a wood pile and some steel toe cap boots, you should definitely chop some wood. Uh, I think it would, it would be good for everybody. Yeah. I was, uh, so I was watching your Ted talk, um, over the last couple of days. I think you've got two of them out there, which we will link to in the show notes, but, um, maybe we could just start off with a bit of a general, uh, question as to, I'm interested as to why you got into the field of mental health in the first place. So, well, I was in medical school and I got really intrigued with the idea that um, two human minds could come together and something therapeutic could happen. And I also got really interested in, I don't know, the medical notion of the mind, right? And what happens when things go wrong? What's the difference between normal anxiety that keeps us safe and um, anxiety that prevents us from achieving our goals. And, and I got really interested in the biochemistry of that and really interested in psychotherapy and models of the mind. And uh, I was in medical school at Indiana University and, and actually was struggling with a lot of some, some mood issues and some anxiety myself. And it had uh, gotten into a psychotherapy and just found it really a very interesting and wonderful way of healing. Um, and it also seemed that mental health was going to be a field that continued to expand. So I finished medical school in 2000, and I liked the idea that over the next several decades of my career, we're, we're just going to learn so much, and we're learning so much about the brain. So I think that that's what intrigued me, um, along with the idea that it's just, you know, there's nothing, in my opinion, nothing richer kind of experientially and mentally than, than sitting with a person having a really authentic open conversation, um, about human emotional experience. That just really, I don't know. That's what I loved in medical school was those moments when you'd sit with somebody by their bedside and they, they talk with you and that was helpful to them. So I think that's what led me into mental health. That, that, and I have a, one of my favorite family members, my aunt who has uh, since passed away, she was a, a psychotherapist and a big, a big influence on me. Um, one of the questions I had, uh, which I which I found fascinating, and I picked up um, from your TED talk, was you said that during your your studies at Columbia, because we're obviously going to go on to talk about the impact of food on mental health, that you didn't get any training about nutrition. Yeah, there's very little new training about nutrition, both in, in medical education and in, in uh, you know across the board in uh, terms of mental health training, and, and that's changing. And it's one of the major goals that that I have and a number of us in the field have is to make sure that um, lifestyle gets incorporated into assessment. Because mm -hmm. if, you, if you think about working with a patient who has anxiety, you know somebody's working out three or four times a week and, you know, eating blueberries and wild salmon and kale and really dialed in, that treatment is going to be different than someone who comes to me and they're eating really, you know, awful food that makes you anxious and they're not meditating and not exercising. It just feels like it's really important information to have about somebody. And so that's a way that I've changed my assessment. Every patient I meet, I ask them what they eat, and the answer is just fascinating. It's fascinating to be in the midst of a psychiatric evaluation, and you know, as a psychiatrist, we're you know really thinking of you know what what what's wrong and how can we help to then get a piece of information like someone is a vegetarian 
right? Or um, someone is eating paleo. Where there are effects of those diets in terms of someone's nutrient intake and um, and great interventions. And mm. so, uh, you know, the the literature is more clear about depression, but you know, clinically, I, I find those two. I really find uh, that that uh, you know, pure anxiety without some mood effects, or vice versa. You know, most people who have some struggles with depression often struggle with anxiety, and so uh, food becomes a really uh, interesting intervention, and, and if, uh, unlike a lot of stuff, right, psychotherapy that takes a lot of time, medications which people have concerns about, uh, food is something people are already doing every day. So why not why, why not let, let's improve that in terms of supporting brain health? Mm. Yeah, exactly. I I I mean, I'm totally on board with you. And it must be like you know, when speaking to people, I think one of the early indicators is, or one of the early easy wins to make them feel better almost instantly is what are you eating? How's it affecting you? I mean, a big one, which always comes up in conversations or a few of the big ones. I like the acronym cats, caffeine, alcohol, tobacco, and sugar or sweeteners as well. You could throw it in there, but, um, there's some obvious ones for even for people, people with anxiety that they don't consider that, you know, crushing a, a pot of coffee a day might be contributing to the problem. Exactly, and and those are the types of uh, data points that that need to be uh, part of a mental health assessment. And, and I think everybody can agree with that. And if you think back, anyone listening to you know seeing a mental health professional, you know certainly a lot of folks are asking about food. But you know, especially if we apply this to general medicine, when was the last time you saw your primary doctor? And mm. you know, was there a detailed assessment of your diet? And it doesn't take forever on a. Actually, the same assessment I use on in my practice is up on my website at jeramcmd.com um, and also in my new book, Eat Complete. And, um, and I spend a lot of time talking about assessment and how you should think about your diet and your goals. Because I find what, what happens so often is people don't consider themselves um, as individual eaters and really reflect on some of the notions like the eating culture that you come from and you know, where your challenges are, where your strengths are. And so that's something, um, so we've got a, an e-course coming out quite soon called Eat to Beat Depression. But it also, I think, applies very much to anxiety. And, and, and a big thrust of the course is really trying to help people set goals and think about foods and food categories that across the board are just great for brain health and, and, and anxiety. Mm. Yeah, because it's, I mean, a perfect time of year to be talking about this as well. But um I found myself as somebody with a bit of an addictive personality, um, I gravitated towards kind of going all into diets. Like I, I tried a lot of diets for weight loss. Um, but more recently I would kind of did the paleo strictly and then I did the ketogenic diet strictly, both of which improved my mental health. Um, but kind of t to one of your points, I found myself more recently being a bit more gentle to myself in terms of you know, uh, sort of wandering off the path and back onto it periodically with good, healthy foods. Um, but I think for people who are on that end of the spectrum, it's important to, to, to be a bit gentle on ourselves and not say we have to be, you know, we have to weigh, measure and, and look at our food that way for the rest of our lives. Cause that in itself is, is stressful sometimes. I think so. I mean, rigid plans often help people and excite people because it really allows you to shift behavior very quickly. Um, in our uh, nutritional psychiatry clinic, we have a branch of my clinic that, that really just focuses on helping people with food. And our uh, chef and food coach uh, and I do an assessment and then really focus on uh, gentle goal setting, which is about joyfulness in food. That, that I think when we approach food through a deprivation model of what you can't eat or what you shouldn't eat or mm. what's off, that that... that um, uh, doesn't help people be joyful eaters as much. And what we really find focus on are what are the foods that, that are wonderful for you? How do you create them, uh, prepare them, share them, enjoy them with people in a, in a loving and joyful way, you know, with yourself and others. Um, cause I agree with you. I think that, that when there's rigidity and then you feel you are, you know, breaking the rules, um, it, 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 um, uh, I don't think it puts people in the best mindset longitudinally. I mean, this is why we see people go on and off of diets. So yeah. We talk about a food plan or an eating plan is how I really like to think about food and that, you know, 
sort of choice after choice, meal after meal, day after day, week after week, those little choices really do add up quite a bit. They, they add up to more brain cells uh, is what the latest data cell tells us as you age. Uh, the, uh, the right food choices can decrease your risk of depression by up to 80%. Whereas the wrong food choices can increase your risk of depression by about the same. So it's, uh, I'm sorry, I misspoke there. Uh, the right foods can decrease your risk of depression between 20 to 50% is what the most recent data tells us. Mm. Uh, whereas eating more of the Western diet, you know, the foods that I think everybody knows are, uh, not great for your brain, empty calories, fast food, you know, alcohol, caffeine, okay, mm. caffeine's okay for the brain, but, um, uh, the, the, these are, uh, you know, not not good for you and increase the risk of depression. And actually, uh, on brain scans, people have smaller uh, smaller brains um, as they get older, particularly in the areas that relate to, to memory and emotional processing. Yeah, I mean, uh, through my own journey with having anxiety myself, suffering badly with that, and then changing my diet drastically, I found I would certainly fit into your statistical analysis of the fact that on a diet rich in omega-3 fats, you know, quality green vegetables, I am, you know, massively more stable than, I mean, I haven't done this for a long time, but if you went out and bought me a extra large pizza and a liter of uh, a, a fizzy sugary drink, then uh, I would probably wake up the next morning feeling a bit rough, you know? So, um, so I think we'll, what, we'll, what I'd like to do is kind of come on to eventually talk about some of your favorite foods that are um, easy for people to get hold of and easy for people to use. Um, but before we do that, I'd like to ask you, how does the current diet actually shrink and damage our brains? Or not, yeah, I say so the current the, diet, but like the, the prevailing diet. Yeah, we call it the modern American diet or the mad diet, or um, if we don't want to focus on America, the Western diet, because it's quite prevalent, right? So this diet shrinks the brain in a number of ways. Um, a lot of people get excited about the serotonin molecule, right? The happiness molecule as it is. And serotonin is an interesting molecule, but what's really an exciting brain molecule is uh, BDNF, which is brain derived neurotrophic factor. And if you start paying attention to the news about this molecule, it, it's a, it's a hormone that you make in your brain, uh, which I like because it's not something that, you know, you can go out and buy a supplement or anything. It, 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 and there are certain things that cause you to make more BDNF. And what BDNF does is it tells brain cells to reach out and connect with more brain cells. It tells brain cells, hey, stay alive during the stress. And it even tells the brain, you know what, let's make a few new brain cells. It's a, it's a growth hormone for the brain. And a number of foods increase and, and nutrients increase the expression of BDNF, things like magnesium and zinc and omega-3 fats. And then um, diets that are high in uh, simple sugars, for example, or missing some of these nutrients, which we know um, in Eat Complete, I spend a lot of time, or not a lot of time, but sometime going over what's called nutrient insufficiency, which is the percentage of our American population that doesn't eat the recommended daily allowance of a certain nutrient. Hmm. So for something like magnesium or zinc, again, two nutrients that increase the expression of this growth hormone for the brain, BDNF, uh, magnesium and zinc, about half of our uh, U.S. population doesn't meet the recommended daily allowance. And so you kind of see how over time that works, that uh, a well-fed brain that is exercising, meditating, doing all the things that increase BDNF is going to be bigger because there's more kind of growth signal over uh, a person's lifespan versus a diet that's just missing some of these key nutrients. I mean, if you think about it, the average American eats no omega-3 fats. Mm. Uh, I think our, our annual fish consumption in America is something like 14 pounds per person, right? Yeah. And, and so if you think about how many servings, you know, if that were something like wild salmon or anchovies or sardines, you know, that's not really where we want people. We want people eating seafood, you know, two to four times a week, um, especially individuals with mental health issues and particularly the bivalves. So, but that's a little bit of how the, uh, uh the brain, uh, gets smaller. There's some idea that, that both untreated mental health disorders, this kind of chronic stress of anxiety and depression, uh, increases your risk both of dementia and therefore probably smaller brain. Um, so that, that's another way that, 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 um, kind of lifestyle choices and, and brain size are related. And then I guess the toxins, right? So the stuff, I mean, the stuff that's bad for your brain, right? Trans fats, food dyes, preservatives. I mean, there's some of that, there's not clear direct evidence. Um, but 
But there is, I think, the bigger notion of if you're eating a lot of food dyes, it means you're eating a lot of fake and processed food, mm. right? Stuff that doesn't have natural color. The, the natural colors in food, the rainbow, those are very brain protective, really interesting molecules. You know, lycopene, sulforaphane, anthocyanins, the stuff that makes our food naturally different colors, very powerful brain health molecules. Uh, and so, you know, again, a diet that has lots of artificial coloring doesn't probably have these other more rich natural colors. And, and so um, it's that way that a bad food choice kind of pushes a good food choice off the plate. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, uh, I love one of the, the, the quotes you said, which is overfed but undernourished in terms of people, yeah. are, people are getting enough calories to, to fuel them, but not enough nutrients to fuel them in a, in a good way. And, and previously on the, on the podcast, I've interviewed, uh, Dr. Terry Walls, um, who I'm sure you know. Yeah. Know yeah Terry, Terry, Terry has kale on her business card. So she and I are <laughs> yeah. pals. We're kale buddies. There you go. Very, very inspiring woman and a great example of what happens when, you really take health into your own hands. And, and also I think the challenges of that, I mean, she, Terry's a physician, right. And, uh, really, you know, had to learn nutrition and radically change her diet and her lifestyle. Yeah. So a question for you, if somebody walks into your practice off the street and is complaining with anxiety or depression or both, um, I'm assuming based on the, them, uh, the fact that uh, the way society is is kind of set up, they're expecting to get pills from you. They you want. You know, I mean, not so much because I'm an integrative psychiatrist and a nutritional psychiatrist. I mean, certainly some people come to see me for that. I mean, I I, I do. Uh, I try I try and do all of all of the jobs of a psychiatrist. And so if people come in really expecting or wanting medications. I, I certainly am able to fulfill that. I, I don't usually prescribe on my first visit with people, and, uh, unless there's something quite clear or dire. Um, and, and I like to go over treatment options where I, I, I tend to think about myself a little bit more like a restaurant. That if you come in and, and tell me what you're hungry for, uh, I'm going to make sure that we, we, we tell you what's on the menu that would satisfy you. And so if you come in with severe anxiety, I'm going to want to hear what it's about, when mm. it started, where it came from, you know, where it's interfering with your function. I mean, a lot of people with anxiety, some of their anxiety makes really good sense. It's a really uh, potentially helpful emotion mm. um, for people. Uh, it's that when it gets overwhelming, as you know, it's just both incredibly uncomfortable, but also makes you not functional. And so... Uh, and then I, I go over what the treatments are, right? There's great evidence for psychotherapy and cognitive behavioral therapy um, for anxiety. I, I focus a lot on food and nutrients as initial steps. My, my favorite treatment for anxiety, the one that by far I think is most effective, is is exercise. Mm. Right? I, I know in my own life, I, I start and end every day with a bike to and from work. And boy, when I get a flat or my bike goes in the closet and I kind of get lazy, I just don't. I don't feel as well. Right? Yeah. Just and it's not a long bike ride. It's maybe a ten minute sprint. Um, so I love exercise. Uh, I really like to think about mindfulness and meditation and how people can train their mind to settle down. Um, other treatments I think about sometimes that are a little off the wall are therapeutic animals. I prescribe a lot of dogs in my practice, mm. um, because I just I, I have a therapy dog in my an emotional support dog in my office. I just people, uh, really bond with animals and, 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 you know, some interesting data that people's blood pressure drops kind of right away when they start to pet an animal or a, a support dog. So, um, and then, you know, there are a number of medications that I think can be really helpful. I find that people are often so frightened of meds and there's such a kind of anti-medication message out there that, uh, that's really damaging and harmful. You know, there's certainly concerns to the medications, uh, but a lot of them, uh, are very well tolerated and, and people do well. And it doesn't mean you have to be on it forever. Right. So, um, and I find people are interested in all of, all of the above, right. Even folks looking for meds, um, they, they usually don't want to be on medication forever. And so they want to, they want these other options on the menu as it were. Mm -hmm. I think like w w what you said is, is interesting, which is the, you're looking at the bigger picture and, and we know, um, for sure that for a lot of people, they, a lot of people that I speak to, anxiety is, is the alarm bell in their life. Um, and they don't necessarily see that because they're in it, but often you speak to people and it's like, I'm feeling very anxious or, 
you know, I'm sweating or my heart's racing or I've got vertigo type feelings or whatever's going on. And then when you kind of peel back the onion, so to speak, because we're talking about food, um, you realize that, you know, they're, they're in a very stressful job working night shifts or they're in a dysfunctional relationship, which they're really struggling with. And so the, these, the, I always, I've said in the past, X doesn't mark the spot necessarily in that the, the way that it's showing up, uh, often is, is created somewhere else in people's lives. Yeah, that's my favorite thing to understand with somebody is is what the anxiety means, right? And differentiating between what I call the pathological anxiety, like this, you know, you're you're worried about something and it and it that's not what it's about, right? Uh, and, and signal anxiety, where you know you're worried um, uh, because you're in an unhappy professional or romantic situation, mm. or you know, and the worry, the challenge I think for people is how to make the worry useful and effective, right? How, I mean, I know that that's, that's my favorite function of anxiety. When something pops into my head and I'm worried about it and then it gets on my to-do list because it was a signal to me of like, you should be worried about that. <laughs> it's, uh, um, so I think that that's one of the, the real challenges is, as you say, you peel back the onion and understand where it's coming from, ideally what it's about. And then, and then, you know, a, a strategy to deal with it. Yeah. So for somebody listening to this saying, well, at the moment I do, uh, I, I am on a, the Western diet, so to speak, can they fix their brain through changing their nutrition? Yeah, I, I think you really can. Um, and I think you should try and prove me wrong if you're listening and think you can't <laughs> by, <laughs> by eating really, really well for the next year. And if I'm wrong, you can, you can, I, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to admit it, but, but, and it's not so much me. I think it's both the data and also common sense. As you were saying, you're going to feel better eating, you know, feeding yourself really well than if you have two liters of soda and a pizza, right? Even though that might be fun mm. going down. And again, not that. You know, I enjoy pizza, I enjoy pasta, I enjoy most foods. It's not that you can't eat those. It's that those shouldn't become uh, a big part of what's called your dietary pattern. So for folks on the Western diet, the first thing I think that's really important is just assessment, right? Just looking at where, like, the low-lying fruit is, um, i.e., every morning you wake up and you have a chocolate croissant for breakfast, right, or a muffin or cereal with low-fat milk, right, which is a lot of kind of empty calories. Or you look at your plate today and tell me how many colors on it, right? And we want your plate to be colorful. So I think it begins with that quick assessment of where you are, because that's always the best place to start. And then I liked what you said earlier, Tim, about being gentle with yourself, that, you know, I find what a lot of people do is they dive in and they, you know, they buy like three bunches of kale and a bunch of salmon, and mm. it's not food that they're used to eating. And so it's not it's not fun. It doesn't taste good. And so I really recommend people starting to focus on what we call food categories and their overall dietary pattern. So as I joke with people, I live on the Upper West Side of Manhattan where there's a lot of families. And so I am required to eat a lot of birthday cake at kids' birthday parties mm -hmm. because I believe that the wish doesn't come true if you don't eat the cake, right? Yeah. So that's one part of my dietary pattern and I enjoy that birthday cake. Yeah. Right? I mean, but, but it's important. <laughs> I have no, I have no choice. I have no choice. Right. But you know, I make sure and, 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 uh, uh, offset that as it were, um, that I'm not eating birthday cake or cake the other days. And, and I'm really loading up that day with stuff that helps me deal with that sugar. I'll eat, you know, a lot of fiber before I go to that, uh, you know, a nice salad before I go to that birthday, I won't go hungry to that birthday party, right? Because I know eating sugar when I'm hungry just makes me a little wackadoodle, just mm. not not good for my mood. So, um, so think about where your dietary pattern is, and then you know the key seafood categories. My little rhyme that I tell people is seafood, greens, nuts, and beans, because if the basis of your diet consists of those foods, you're eating the healthiest foods on the planet. You know, there are a couple other foods I'd throw in there, particularly for anxiety. I think eggs are actually really important. Um, they are the top source of a nutrient called choline. Choline is a B-like vitamin. It's not like folate. And really some of the only data about anxiety and dietary patterns, choline pops up as, as a nutrient that people who uh, have more anxiety eat less choline. So, you know, it's not perfect data, but, but eggs are something that I think are particularly uh, important, especially when you think about that breakfast we're talking about. Somebody swaps out mm. chocolate croissant or muffin or, you know, low fat stuff for a couple of eggs in the morning. Um, well, let's just talk about what happens. What, what happens then is you're eating something that's more nutrient dense. 
meaning that you're getting more nutrients per calorie. So two eggs is just 140 calories. And the whole idea behind all of my work, Eat Complete, The Happiness Diet, um, Fifty Shades of Kale, all the books are around increasing the nutrient density in your diet. So you're going to see more colors, you're going to see more seafood, more nuts and things like um, pumpkin seeds and, and almonds, mm-hmm. more beans. Because if you, you know, think about a food category where you can get the whole rainbow, well, beans are right there, red beans, black beans, <laughs> white beans, right? Um and uh, and greens is just you know greens are a great foundational part of your diet. Something's really easy to increase. Um, one of the reasons I wrote Fifty Shades of Kale is as kale was kind of coming on board as a trending food, I kept talking to people in my practice about greens. I say like you know I know kale's healthy, but like I don't know what do you do with it. Mm. And you know a lot of people just go to a kale salad, which you know if you're not a veggie kind of eater, a kale salad's a challenge. I mean it's a chewy, dense, hearty green, and so. But there are all kinds of wonderful ways to enjoy greens, right? In smoothies and in soups, um, you know, uh, mix in the darker greens with some, you know, maybe lighter greens if you're used to those. Uh, We make great pestos. Kale pesto is just a wonderful dish. Um, You know, you can saute kale. You can, uh, you know, put it in everything, put it in cocktails even, right? So, Mm. and when you're doing that, it's not just a gimmick, right? It's a trendy food. When you're adding kale to anything, let's say this morning to my scrambled eggs, I add a cup of kale. So I've gone from 140 calories to 175 calories, let's say. Right, so I've just added 33, 34 calories for that uh, cup of kale. And with that, just a cup of kale, now I've gotten 100% of my daily, 130% of my daily vitamin C. I've gotten 200% of my vitamin A. I've gotten 600% of my vitamin K. I've gotten uh, you know, 10 to 20% of my folate in iron. I've gotten a good amount of fiber, a couple more grams of protein. So that's nutrient density, all that just for 33 calories. Mm. And so that's where... Again, focusing on just those little ads, um, I'm always adding like lemon zest and, 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 you know, small amounts of chopped fresh herbs to my food because it just increases the nutrients I'm getting and particularly what are called the phytonutrients, the plant-based molecules. Yeah, I love it. And actually now, interestingly, my, if I bake up some, um, some kale in the oven and make some kale chips and put coconut oil on them and put that out on the table, my four-year-old will demolish it devours the kale chip, right? I love that you bring that up. It's like people always ask me, how do you get kids to eat healthy? And that's like my favorite. You put some coconut, some olive oil on, on kale, make kale chip. People, they're yeah. just delicious. Sprinkle um, a little salt on it. They'd love it. Love it. Right. And, and, and people are always surprised. I've got two kids, three and six and, you know, they, 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 they don't eat all of the weird stuff I cook, but they eat most of it, you know, and, and things that surprise you like mussels, right? From mm. very early age, we've had our kids eating mussels because they're such a great source of vitamin B12 and one of the major nutrients related to mental health and anxiety. Um, and, and a nutrient that a lot of people are missing out on. Um, so seafood and particularly the bivalves, mussels, clams and oysters, you know, in, incredible food to, you know, give your kids a no thank you portion or cook up mussels at home and, and have some really good rich garlic butter for them to dip them in. And, and mm. it, you know, it, our job as parents, I think, is really to, to help our kids expand their palate um, and experience a lot of different foods and learn about food. I love bringing the kids into the kitchen and having them chop stuff up, right, <laughs> or yeah. help out or pick things in the grocery store. Um, so they're engaged with uh, with their with what they're eating. Yeah, and as a result of uh, the Dr. Terry Wall's stuff, because my wife got really got into that. Um, my kids will eat beef heart now because obviously organ meats being important, they'll they'll get a beef heart and look at it and help chop it up, and we we chop it generally into sort of half inch cubes and then fry it with some with some bacon and stuff like that, and they they'll they'll devour that as well. So. Um, that's impressive. I got, I've, I got a heart in my meat share once and I did my best, but you'll, you'll have to try, you have to send me your recipe. That's yeah. a, but that, that's a, but it is, it is one of those, um, I think joys in, of parenting where as we're exploring as eaters, you, you know, we get to engage the kids in that, mm. um, ideally. And you know, a lot of people I think have a big challenge around this of having kids who are picky eaters or kids who don't, you know, like certain foods and, you know, that's the creative challenge of parenting that we all signed up for is yeah. how do you, you know, how, and, and there are always, I think, good and interesting, smart solutions. I had a, 
a patient who had an autistic son who really didn't like flavors or textures. And so I recommended, well, you know, and he loved plants and he loved one herb. I can't remember, oregano, oddly. And I said, well, why don't you guys grow an herb garden this summer? And so they planted an herb garden. The son got really into the plants and expanded the types of herbs he was eating. One started adding in a little basil, added in a little rosemary, right? Then the rosemary could go on a little, um, you know, some, some, in some potatoes and, and, and began to, you know, just a little bit open up the door to some more foods and more eating. And it's that kind of slow, steady progress that I try and advocate to patients when it comes to eating, right? Yeah. Don't, don't do it all. Don't do it all today. Today, look at your plate and, and add an extra color. You know, this week, think about what's your favorite seafood meal. Have you eaten mussels or wild salmon or, or done something creative with anchovies? A lot of people haven't. I certainly hadn't. I didn't eat any mm. seafood until I was 30 years old. I eat everything in the sea now. Yeah. And, and so, again, that's just, I think, an example of palate development. And so for the people listening to look at their challenges as an eater and really kind of small, like no pun intended, bite-sized pieces that it, you know, re- proper eating happens one choice at a time. Yeah. Yeah. And I think for me, like my, you know, uh, your kids want to be like you in a lot of cases, they want to emulate you. So as Gandhi said, be the change you wish to see in the world. Um, if you start introducing, like I started eating, um, wild sardines in, extra virgin olive oil because I just love sardines now and I have them with some eggs and then one of my kids started eating them and before you know it they're all eating wild sardines in olive oil which is an amazing food and Uh, and uh, very uh, affordable very easy to get and it's an amazing food right absolutely and I love that you mentioned that because so many people are going to turn up their nose when they hear sardines right but the canned fish right why even wild salmon sardines anchovies I mean they are by far the best value in the grocery store and the best value when it comes to brain health because they're very low cost food and just you know I'd so much rather people eat those foods than take a fish oil pill because you have all the other nutrients that are just amazing in seafood, zinc, selenium, vitamin B12, a complete protein, you know, um, anchovies and sardines are, are some of the top sources of calcium because you eat those little tiny small bones um, and digest them, right? So lots of benefits to the small seafood. And, and I think just a great example, Tim, right? Most kids out there in the world do not eat sardines. And the reason is that their parents aren't eating them. Right. Mm-hmm. And, and so the more that we can inspire our kids and, and lead by example, I, I think the better eaters will all be. Yeah. And also, if you're a business traveler, um, they're amazingly portable if you don't pour the oil on yourself when you're sat on the plane. But um, yeah. <laughs> if, you can, if you can manage to drain them out and not get it on you, you know, I, I always take like macadamia nuts, a couple of cans of those, a bit of beef jerky, and I could I could live the whole day off of that. So. Um, that's good. That's a good. That's a good travel list. Let's see. Our travel list usually is um, our water bottle, a big bag of cashews, some seaweed snacks, mm. sometimes some like tubes of coconut oil, um, and uh, yeah, and then also sometimes a little beef jerky. Um, I haven't been bold enough to pull out the sardines on the plane yet, but maybe you'll you'll challenge me to do that. <laughs> yeah, I think you should do that. You could you could get a little bowl. My favorite thing to do is a little bowl of kale. I'll take the sardines, lid off the sardines and I'll pour the oil onto the kale. And then I kind of dump the sardines on top of that. And then I've made a salad. Um, and, and that, that right there is the, a great example of that is brain food, greens and seafood. I mean that, you know, that, that, that is as good as it gets. It could be wild salmon, mackerel, sardines, anchovies. And, and, and I think a lot of people who aren't used to that fishy taste, there's lots of wonderful ways to modify that, right? Like, um, again, I didn't like seafood at all, but a real Caesar dressing where you take a, a tin of anchovies and put in a lot of lemon juice, lemon zest, a little mayo, some mustard, right? And, and, and make a, uh, and lots of garlic, right? And you make a wonderful dressing for greens where, um, you know, if you're not, if you're, if you're not up to the, the level of just dumping, uh, uh, a can of sardines on your greens, uh, but but that that mm. is brain food, right? Uh, uh, greens and seafood uh, is, is is something that if every, if everybody included a meal like that a couple of times a week, you know, our health quotient uh, globally would go up just by leaps and bounds. Yeah, and we might even have better conversations as a result. We would definitely have better <laughs> conversations. I have this. Uh, there's this statistics I love that uh, 
So uh, iron, a very, very important nutrient for brain health and mental health. You need it to make all of the feel-good hormones. Uh, it's you know, necessary for uh, transporting oxygen to your brain. So about 2 billion people on planet Earth don't get enough iron. And because of that, um, researchers estimate that we, we have a much lower IQ to the point that if everyone on planet Earth ate enough iron – our global IQ would go up by 13%. We'd have a 13% smarter planet. And mm. I think that would lead to better conversations and more happiness for sure. Mm. Yeah. And I love, you know, I love, I love that you mentioned the birthday cake. I mean, one of my, one of the, the scientists I've followed on the ketogenic side, Dominic D'Agostino, um, I remember listening to an interview with him and he said, yeah, when I go to the cinema, when I go to the movie theater, I still eat popcorn. And I was like, Popcorn's allowed? Okay, cool. So <laughs> last time I went to the, uh, uh, it's obviously not on the ketogenic diet, but what his point is, is that you, you need some flexibility in your plan for it to have longevity f- for you to be able to do it for the rest of your life. So, um, as you said, you're, you're setting the foundation for, um, for greatness with eating good most of the time so that when you do get offered a piece of birthday cake, you don't need to be the weird one and say, no, I can't eat that. Um, you can have a small piece. Tim, I'm really curious about your experience on the ketogenic diet because yeah. there, there's a lot of soft data around that. Uh, we don't. I, I prescribe that diet occasionally to patients um, because uh, the interesting part is that over time on a ketogenic diet, your brain switches over. Um, ketogenic diet, for everyone, I'm, I'm sure most of your listeners know, but it's a diet that consists mainly of fat. And your brain mainly runs on sugar, on blood glucose. So if you're not eating blood glucose, you basically need to make a fuel for the brain, and you do that by breaking down fat, and and so you uh, make what are called ketones. Now, ketones are interesting. Over time, what some of the science suggests is the brain becomes uh, higher in sort of what's called GABA, GABAergic uh, tone. And GABA neurons are the inhibitory or anti-anxiety neurons of the brain. So when you drink, uh, when you have alcohol, when you take Ativan, right, um, uh, uh, anti-anxiety medication, those are all influencing GABA. And so I'm just curious to what your what you noticed your mental health effects were. Um, better. Um, so. That's a scientific response, isn't it? Brilliant. Um, so I, st- I started that, that, off. That, that, that's actually that's the one I look for on our on our website on our clinic page. As you know, it better is actually the first. Like that's really my only goal. You come yeah. in and you say, you know, I'm better. So yeah. that's, that's a good that works for me. So I'm a I'm a bit of a rabbit holer, meaning that I kind of I mean I, I would I'll thematically get onto something and then I just need to know everything about it, which probably caused me to have anxiety in the first place. But. Um, I st- I moved from I realized that my food was part of my problem and I moved um a number of years ago 8 years ago to a, a paleo diet and I was enjoying that and and so the ketogenic diet was just a step further for me which was I was already enjoying grass-fed beef um grass-fed butter the coconut oil and the fish and all the amazing vegetables I could get my hands on um and I just took out the sweet potatoes and the white rice and and any other sugar um and what I found is from a, from a mental standpoint is that my, my equilibrium was just much more stable. My energy was more consistent. If I didn't eat breakfast, for instance, which I don't eat breakfast now, I'll get up and have a cup of tea. Um, and I just feel like my, my baseline is much steadier. Now, today, if I go out and come, come off a of plan, which I do occasionally and, and eat some carbs and that kind of thing, I just, and maybe it's because I've been ketogenic for a while, but I just feel a bit more sluggish. Um, my brain fog is a bit more prevalent in terms of my ability to think clearly isn't there as much. So for me, as an, and I don't recommend it to everybody because A, it's, it's, uh, it takes some work. It's difficult. I mean, we, we talk about kale and fish. Well, this is another level of going to a restaurant and having to kind of reorganize yeah. the menu for your own benefit because you can't eat that and you can't eat that. So, um, but yeah, I feel like, I, f- I feel like it's taken me personally to another level of, of mental clarity and, and stable energy. Yeah, I think it's a great, it's just a great example of the brain food effect, right? That, that, that what I think, uh, I hope everyone listening hears is that there are a lot of interesting moves ranging from, you know, eating just fewer sugars and simple carbohydrates to eating ketogenic diet to trying out like the paleo or whole 30 plans, mm. which really just, you know, they all focus on pretty much the same thing. I mean, the ketogenic is a little more extreme, but they focus on diets that, um, 
focus on sugar and carbohydrates more yeah. as the enemy than things like fat or cholesterol, which is a big shift for people and in really a way that um, our nutritional uh, information hasn't helped us, right? If you just look at the, um, you know, efficacy of our intervention public health wise, right? Don't eat cholesterol, don't eat fat. That was really quite damaging. And so uh, getting people back onto these, you know, what we call whole foods, whole real food, stuff that you chop mm. up with a knife and saute in a little olive oil and eat, um, stuff that doesn't come from a package, stuff that wasn't created in a laboratory or, um, you know, as we say, uh, was built for the shelf, not for your health. The, oh, the, yeah. yeah, so it's, uh, it's uh, th- those, you know, it comes down to that decision every day of you look at your plate or you're, you know, you're going out to lunch. And, um, we, we do that actually some in our clinic where we go, you know, we go out to lunch because we, uh, we have our lunch hour. Sometimes we bring food or sometimes we make food, but what's the healthiest option. Mm. And, and it's really an exciting time for eaters. There's so many interesting options, right? Uh, two salad places have opened up right by my office, uh, sweet greens and chopped where you can go in and get like the most amazing array of, of vegetables and, and uh, rainbow plants. Um, uh, so, you know, there, there are, um, opportunities for brain food everywhere. Yeah. And, um, New York's a great place for salads. I will say on the keto side, I don't blanket recommend it to everybody because my wife, for instance, who, um, is pretty lean, her kind of fighting weight is pretty lean anyway. She went on the ketogenic diet and her period stopped. Um, and so for women from, for hormonal reasons, obviously it's, it's not always ideal if you're lower fat to, to put yourself in that state because you, you need to carry a bit more weight on your body. But, um, so I normally go with, with a lot of the stuff that we're talking about and base it around a whole 30 or paleo type template and then allow people to see how they do from there. Um, that's yeah, a great place think, to start. I think that is a great place to start. I mean, you cut, you know, cut out the white carbs and the beige food and people, um, it, it just, you know, it gives you some guidelines for eating. And I think also, you know, the mo- the most important message is that the way we, you know, the first step to changing any behavior is observing that behavior. Mm. And so really uh, the, my favorite part actually of the of eat complete, my most recent, uh, it's a kind of a brain health book and cookbook was the part, uh, it's a set of kind of uh, mindful eating skills and exercises, where I find that, you know, even as I might make the good choices, right, I still have to remind myself to take a deep breath, look at my plate, right, think about where the food came from and to have gratitude for it, right? Mm. Uh, we, we try and start meals in our house with a nice moment of silence, right, uh, to put, put my phone off and away from the table, right, uh, that the... the, the um, you know, that that exercise of engaging with the food or a simple mindful eating exercise, right? Put a grape in your mouth today and don't eat it. Just hold it in your mouth and mm. really sense it, right? And for you know, 30 seconds and feel and then take one bite and, and really experience the grape. Uh, it, 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 it really you know, only takes a couple of minutes but can shift your mindset about food and taste and, and – um, just something that I think a lot of people are missing and that helps, helps people keep on track. It just helps make a better choice. Yeah. One, one of the, the final things I wanted to ask you was your take on gluten because gluten is obviously demonized uh, as being a, a bad thing. I don't obviously being keto, I don't eat a lot of gluten anyway, but I've interviewed uh, Dr. Tom O'Brien, for instance, who says that, you know, gluten stays in your system for up to 10 months um, and, and is the issue. So, how does that fit in, in in your plan? Yeah, so my most recent book cookbook was uh, gluten free. Um, I, I think the gluten is quite overhyped in the sense that I would say about eight percent, eight to ten percent of the U.S. population has an issue. Two percent with celiac, and maybe six to eight percent with non celiac gluten sensitivity. You know, the, the, there's a lot of fear mongering in the wellness world right now. Right, where, where, uh, which really concerns me. And a lot of kind of fantasies of silver bullets and root causes of things that are all food related. And I've worked with a number of patients where that's really been quite damaging and harmful. You know, people have been on gluten free, dairy free diets for, you know, a year and are still profoundly depressed and suicidal. 
And so I have a concern with the idea that it's all gluten. Certainly for some people that's true. If you just run the numbers, if you think, you know, about 1% to 2% of our population um, uh, has celiac disease. So that's 3 million people uh, in the U.S. at least, uh, 3 to 6 million, right? And if you think of then how many miracle cure stories there are about those individuals where, you know, they have horrible health, they discover they have celiac, they get off of gluten, and they have amazing health. It's it's a miracle. Mm-hmm. So with enough of those stories generating about, it's almost like we all begin to wonder and feel that gluten is the kind of evil imposter. The points I think that are important about gluten is we've never eaten gluten like we're eating it. We're, we're not eating fermented grains, which is what traditionally we've always done. And, right. and when you ferment food, it helps break down the gluten. If you actually double ferment wheat, it has non-detectable levels of gluten. or The gluten level is so low, it could be listed as a gluten-free food. Right, which is less than 20 parts per million or something, right? Yeah, something yeah. like that, right? So so that's a double fermentation. Now, now, you know, usually when you make bread, you add a little more flour in there as you're kneading it. So I'm not suggesting that people with celiac can uh, tolerate that. I'm just, I guess, pointing out that we put gluten in everything now. And so, uh, it, it, you know, most things stay in your system for a long time, right? Uh, most things that we eat or a lot of things that we eat. I'm not sure that means it's bad. Um, so, you know, if when people meet me, if they're, I met, I met a patient with severe anxiety recently who has a lot of sniffling and congestion mm. in her sinuses. And my first thought was like, huh, this isn't classic, but I wonder if there's a gluten or allergic issue here that's getting missed. And so we've put her on a little bit of an elimination diet to see mm. if she's off gluten for a couple of months and she's still having this issue. I, I mean, I'm not going to say that it's the gluten. I'm going to, I'm going to look for the other cause. And so yeah. I guess my take on point about gluten, certainly a huge problem for some people and, and will be a miracle cure. If you are one of those people and you get off of gluten, I think certainly for, some folks in our house is one of them. There's a sensitivity to gluten. Um, in my wife's family, there are a number of people who have, you know, not a classic celiac, but a gluten issue. Um, mm. Many of them have found cutting it out entirely isn't, you know, helps a little bit, uh, but not entirely. And so uh, it's an emerging area. Um, and, and then, you know, certainly there are some more severe, um, my colleague, Emily Deans, uh, just had a reported a case of a woman with a delusional disorder that when she was off gluten went away. So we know that, wow. you know, anything from a psychotic illness to a mood instability can be related to gluten. But, um, you know, is it, is it like a evil molecule that is destroying us? I, I don't think so because the majority of the planet eats lots of gluten and, yeah. uh, you know, it's, uh, and, and has for a long time. So. Yeah, I mean, I would say for people who are interested in, it, as you said, is to consider making your own bread and consider getting your hands on some ancient grains and looking at some of those types of options. Um, I know for myself, um, as a former asthma sufferer, I believe my asthma was was heavily contributed to by gluten because when I stopped, um, my asthma went away, and I'd been taking Ventolin and uh, a variety of steroids for years. Um, interestingly, my doctor had never said maybe it's something you're eating. He just kept giving me the inhalers. Um, again, yeah, well, I mean that's that's. I mean, that was I think the way there you, Well, and it still is, right? I yeah. mean, the, and I still have to be challenged by my patients, where you know, when things are working, and by our kind of traditional Western medical, you know, criteria, you're better, quote unquote. It's like we don't want to rock the boat, right? Mm. We think that our job is done. And, and I think what's happening that's exciting is I think medicine is being challenged. And we're being challenged to do a better job and not simply to give people inhalers and meds and, and let things sit, right? Yeah. That those can be great for symptom control, but how can we really help people transform their lives into health? That was uh, – maybe it sounds grandiose, but the, the subtitle of Eat Complete uh, was uh, the 21 nutrients that fuel brain power, boost weight loss, and transform your health. Because mm. I really believe if people Me too, for sure. eat the nutrient-dense foods that contain these specific nutrients the brain needs, it does improve their health. Yeah. I'm proof of that. Like it can change your life. This isn't. This is no small thing. Yeah, and and and, and you are proof of it, and 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 I'm sure you know a lot of people who are proof of it, and I think everyone listening already has proof of it. Yeah, which is you just know when you eat well and take care of yourself, 
you feel great. You feel better. Whereas when you don't, when you indulge in a way that is destructive with food or with alcohol, you don't feel your best. And, and, you know, it's not just the nutrients. There's also this idea that, you know, when we care for ourselves, Mm. it builds our self-esteem and our confidence and our self-love. So because you're worth it, Drew, right? Yeah, you are worth it. I mean, it's really, you really are. I mean, I think it's a, I'm in the really privileged position of I get to see people at their very worst and they come and they meet me and I, I can attest to just the profound resilience and power of the human spirit. I am just, I'm really just blown away by the changes I see in my patients. And I think humbled by that in terms of uh, the hope that it gives us, the hope that it should give everyone. And especially when you're in that darker spot and you feel you know, I'm sure you've been there, Tim. We all have, where you, you just feel overwhelmed with your symptoms. Mm. Um, it, but yeah, people people really can make profound changes in their life, and and uh, and it's so exciting to see that and to be part of it. And 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 I hope to, you know, through your work, Tim, encouraging it in a lot of people who don't, you know. One of the nice things of new media is just so many resources for people, mm. you know, uh, um, and people sharing their stories about mental health, and that's. I should mention my, my other job is with the American Psychiatric Association where I work with their communications council. And um, one of the things that's, I think, exciting to us is the amount of debate and talk uh, and conversation about mental health and depression and anxiety mm. and, and suicide. And that that is just such a wonderful change in really the past five or ten years that we're talking about it. Because when we talk about it, that, 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 then, then we can do something about it. Yeah. Yeah, and that's you know part of my goal with the with the podcast was to make all of this just more accessible to people because I don't know going back even fifty years ago somebody suffering badly may not even go to the doctor let alone consider you know a holistic approach they wouldn't even talk to anybody about it they wouldn't and and, and I and I don't think it's fifty years ago I think that still happens today I think yeah. I saw a statistic recently that eighty percent of men with clinical depression never seek treatment eighty wow. percent right and so. Uh, and, and I think the same is true. You know, the most commonly diagnosed disorder are anxiety disorders. I think 40 million Americans. And, you know, the, the majority, I think, never get a consultation. And, and I think part of that is that people really misunderstand what, what psychiatrists and mental health professionals do is that our job is to, uh, help you understand your symptoms, uh, in the language of a diagnosis and then help you understand what the treatment options are and then walk with you down that path, right? And I think so often people meet me and they they assume I'm going to give them a prescription and say goodbye Mm. um, or want to put them on the couch for the next 10 years. And that's not the case at all. What I want to do is make sure that you're better, right, that you know what you're struggling with and you have a set of tools uh, to be fully functional. And um, I, I hope more people are getting that message. But we yeah. are, you know, mental health professionals are here and we are your allies. Yeah. And I think for people listening who are in the, in the dark, darker spots or the, the, the difficult phase, um, you probably don't know how good you can actually feel because in my situation, if you take a bad diet and throw on no exercise and lots of alcohol and travel and a stressful job and not a lot of time in nature, um, there's just so much upside that as you, People think, well, it's not the food, but once you once you start, you know, tinkering with some of those dials, you realize that there's there's just l- incrementally loads of ways that you can improve things over time. It's not and doesn't have to be tomorrow, as you said earlier. It's it's about making small steps and just continuing to to you know grow in the process. Yep, that's exactly what it's about. I think it's it's that you know I like the idea. There are a lot of dials, right? And um, for people struggling, the the, the I think there's a great feeling when you start to fiddle with those dials and you feel more control, mm. right? You go out for some exercise and you come back and you feel better. That's something you did. You stop at the market on the way home tonight and you make yourself a really delicious, your favorite, healthiest meal, right? Uh, uh, and you do that efficiently and quickly and, and, and you know, not a complicated way. It, it, it just, it, it, those little um, self-care moments add up. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. I totally agree. So, um, people, we're, we're going to put all of the stuff we talked about in the show notes and, and seafood, greens, nuts and beans is brilliant. You did omit the dark chocolate, which is very important. A little important. dark chocolate. It's an anxiety population. So the you know, dark, 
<laughs> excuse me, dark chocolate always gets a little controversial, or some people get anxious from the theobromines. But uh, right, yeah, okay. but the, the full is seafood greens, nuts and beans, and a little dark chocolate because I think dark chocolate and nuts are a great dessert. But yeah, er, anyone um, who wants more information, I'm uh, on Twitter and Instagram and Facebook is uh, Drew Ramsey MD. My website is DrewRamseyMD.com. If you want to learn about our clinic, um, well, there's some information about the clinic and the books, and I also have a, a free seven day brain boost program that just goes over some of some of the content we're talking about today, and then as I said, we're, we're launching Eat to Beat Depression this month. And so if folks want to uh, take a peek at that, that's a, a e-course really that, that, that helps walk you through the, the changes that most folks need to make in their diet to improve their brain health. Mm. Brilliant. Well, thanks very much for coming on, Drew. Appreciate your time. Tim, thanks so much and good luck with you this year with your podcast. And I really appreciate you uh, spreading the word and helping people um, have a better understanding of anxiety and and better access to the many, many treatments that are out there. And for everybody listening, I I really wish you the very best of luck. And if we can uh, be of help in our clinic in terms of any food planning or assessment, please be in touch. All the best, Drew. All right. Take care, Tim. So there you have it. That was Dr. Drew Ramsey. Loved his discussion. He was making my mouth water with all of his lovely sounding recipes and ideas for food. Very good stuff. I hope that gave you some ideas that you can implement in your kitchen with your family straight away. If you have any guest suggestions yourself or people you think I should be speaking to or topics you think I should be speaking about, please go to the contact page at anxietypodcast.com and send me an email or fill the form out. I'd love to hear from you. If you want to connect on social media, Tim JP Collins on Twitter, Facebook, where I'm most active, probably Instagram, where I post a lot of pictures. Um, get in touch and say hello. Let's be friends. Um, I love to hear from listeners and people when they've got more questions and ideas. So please do get in touch. And remember, until next time, less anxiety, more life. Thank you for listening to the Anxiety Podcast. For more information, go to theanxietypodcast.com.